Hiya. Hi. So, as a visual artist and thinker, um, you have addressed questions about black culture and history, not just in relation to yourself or to a particular community, but really as a way of um, changing all our self-consciousness as Europeans. Um, and part of that practice is also that you engage in a dialogue with black artists, thinkers from the past. Um, today we're going to talk about one particular project and one particular dialogue with such an artist from the past, Edgar Cairo. Can you tell us a little bit about who Edgar Cairo was and why he is so important? Uh, Edgar Cairo is a, a Dutch writer of Surinamese descent who wrote his first book, Timiku, in 1969. Oh, not yet the video. <laughs> who wrote his first book in uh, 1969. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and it was called Timiku. And the nice thing about this uh, book is that he wrote, rewrote it two times. The first book was um, 39 pages. The second book was about 100 pages, and the third book was 200 pages. And the first book was written in Surinamese language, Saranantongo. The second one was written in Surinamese Dutch, with a lot of side notes so people could understand what is actually being said. And the third book was in Standard Dutch, written in Standard Dutch. Now, I um, got into a dialogue with Edgar Cairo with his first book, the 39 a pages book because it was written in a style that is not um, used anymore a way of telling stories and the way it used to go is that someone the teller the storyteller would sit in the middle and then everybody would sit around and the storyteller would say I was in Arnhem and I went to the artist uh, Studium Generale and then someone in the audience will say in what year was that and then I will say it was in 2015 if I'm the storyteller. So did you go? And then someone else in the audience will say, "Did you go to the uh, to the church or were you at the Rosette? Because the Rosette is this building that is yellow, and the church has a whole different atmosphere." And then I will say, "I was at the Rosette." And then somebody else will say, "Bato speaker, I was there," and start a song that basically relates to this location. Now. When you tell a story in that way, and you only write the writer's perspective or the storyteller's perspective, you only end up with 39 pages. But actually telling the story is a collective and a communal thing that would take all evening to tell the story. Now, I engaged with this first book of Edgar Cairo, and thankfully his brother, Edgar Cairo is dead, but his brother, his older brother, was willing to be his proxy in this in this uh, conversation. And I took parts from his um, book, which I thought was interesting and relevant to our current situation, and asked his brother to um, recite those texts. And then I asked the ladies from the choir who sing the classical Surinamese songs to look for the right song that fits with what is being said there. So basically, we reenacted the way of storytelling that was being used before, and we'll see a little clip of that now. Nawatra e datra you 
you ebi praxeri. Na watra e do fu you gina sting fu consensi. If you safir you srefi you a wang dang na watra kalekti you srefi opo you pot you potina mindri soso santa wang. Mi esideni na oso, mi esidadoro. Mi esideni na oso, mi esidadoro. Chobolele goni na oso, teke mi beti saka konji mi. Atori di meshide, wandede dai na kondre. Mo purwe dadoro. Un purwe dadoro, bika sane kuku kontori da suma bere. Purwe dadoro. So, as you can see, sorry, you have the storyteller who says something, the first singer responds, responds to the text that has been said, and then the choir, the rest of the people, respond to that. So it's like a one, two, three step, and then it goes back to the, sorry. No. Um, so you actually revived this older form of storytelling, which is this following this logic of somebody is saying something, others are responding. But you did something quite drastic, because you revived the form and uh, let them speak and sing, but you didn't offer a translation to explain to the audience what was being told or what was being sung. Well, that was a deliberate choice. Um, we actually, at the Tropen Museum at that point, we had a, for this performance, it was kind of sold out. We had a lot of people of Surinamese descent, especially second and third generation, and a lot of white Dutch people. And I deliberately didn't give a translation to see what was going to happen. I actually I had a question in mind. And what you saw is that the white Dutch people enjoyed the sound, the visuals, the songs, the notes. And the Surinamese people, second and third generation, were actually quite frustrated. They were like, why haven't you given us a translation? Because I don't understand what is being said. I only understand half of it. And that was actually my question. If our parents came to live in Europe and we are now Europeans, then how much of this culture that we come from is still ours? How truthful can you say, I am Surinamese, if you can't reproduce the culture that, it, that you came from? So that was a question and a debate that I started with the second and third generation Surinamese people by doing this project. So it's kind of a dual gesture of on the one hand reactivating a collective form of memory and at the same time making it tangible for people that this collective form is also breaking down in some ways. Yeah, it's breaking down and we could revive it, but if we revive it as European natives, we have to revive it in a form that is understandable within the continental European context. Can you reveal a little bit, with the little time we have left, about what is actually being handed down through these songs and these stories? Well, it's really um, good that you asked that, because, um, of course, the, the narrative of enslavement has been written down from a Western perspective. And these songs are actually songs that um, are used to uh, celebrate the ancestors in ritual or in when somebody dies, these songs are being sung. And when you actually look at the text, we can start the other video, but then without sound. Oh, okay, then it's okay. And then, uh, because I translated it a little bit for another piece, and these songs basically sing about the plight of enslavement. So people say, like for instance, she was singing, um, uh, take, go and take my my uh, writing, not my writing gear for me, not literally writing gear, because stories are cooking up. There's things in people's in people's belly that need to come out. 
this is just the, the first song that she sung that actually starts the whole conversation. And then after that, the other songs come about, uh, one of these songs is, that I am so thin is not because I cannot eat, because I am the stork, I live next to the river. So why is it then that I am so thin, right? So a question is being asked, and then of course it is to the people who are in the crowd or who are singing with the song to respond why they are so thin. And these songs all originated in the time of slavery. So rather than having a historical record on paper, the historical ref record is being uh, kept within the songs and the rituals, and unfortunately this part is getting lost in current society. I think we have to close off. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs>